maybe I consider everybody in the world to be my friend and I just put a copy of this thing up on my server that anybody can access and I'm not charging anybody for it, so it's not commercial, right? Right. Right. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian Arbuck, and today I'm joined by Brian Mitchell and Ryan Rampersad to talk about DRM. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED27. All right, guys, so DRM, obviously an acronym. What does that stand for? It stands for Digital Rights Management. Yeah. So what the heck does that mean? We got three words. I mean, it, it protects your digital rights by managing them. Yes. <laughs> This uh, digital rights management restricts the usage of proprietary copyrighted works. So what this means is if you are purchasing some media, let's say a video for example, mm -hmm. it might have DRM on it. So you have to authenticate that you are who you, or you are the user who bought that content. So the the creator can enforce a new purchase for every time for every person that wants to own that. Yep. Yep, and that's like the primary reason that companies put DRM onto the content that they sell is to prevent piracy. That's kind of their primary goal usually. Mm -hmm. It also has a couple of other side effects that like companies would really like, such as being able to lock people into their ecosystems, right? So if I buy an ebook from Amazon, Amazon would really love it if you bought a Kindle to write, read that on, right? And and didn't buy a Nook, for example. Mm -hmm. Does Barnes & Noble still make Nooks? They do. Okay, good. Barnes & Noble still exists? They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, so that's another reason that they might use DRM. Region locking is also a thing. Personally, as somebody who like grew up on the internet, I don't really think that region locking should be a thing anymore. Oh, I agree. It's it's kind of because it's like a weird holdover from back when like distribution had to happen by a different company in each country that like that piece of work was going to be distributed in, you know? And so like each of those companies would have the rights to distribute it only in that specific company. And so nowadays like they still have those contractual agreements, you know, in place a lot of times, especially mm -hmm. like especially I think in the in the book world, right? Where you've got like a publisher that deals with different distributors in different areas. And so they would, yeah, use DRM to make sure that like I cannot buy a British copy of a book, mm -hmm. right? But like I, I live in a world where it's like, yep, something's published. It's available worldwide. Yeah. For the because it's digital. Yeah, exactly. Also now with with everywhere. video Back in the day before HD, there was NTSC and PAL mm -hmm. for different video formats. So you mm. have different frame rates based on like historical reasons for the power grid and things. So that's that's why there are yeah. differences between And that that was videos. a legitimately okay reason. And so that kind of fell into the regions as well. But now that everything's HD, it's all common and Right. 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 Yep. We've got much more kind of solidified standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another reason actually that region locking happens, and I think this is a little bit more legitimate, is that like, I specifically I'm thinking about games right now because I read an extended article uh, about how Steam determines like what price they're going to set different games at in different regions, right? In the, here in the US, we're really used to AAA games coming out at about the $60 price point, you know, give or take, depending on whether you get like the premium edition that comes with like the art book and the, you know, mm -hmm. the season pass with all the DLCs and yada yada. But like, if you're going to sell that game in Russia, you can't just convert from dollars to rubles and sell it at that price because like the economies in those in those two different countries are vastly different consumers in russia won't be able to pay that price for a bunch of games right so they have to kind of adjust regionally according to the norms and expectations of like the market in that region and so then region locking is necessary to prevent people in the u.s from buying like russian copies of games and then just playing it in the u.s anyway which sounds fair yeah yeah, but at the same time, it's like, okay, if it's not priced to move, then should it be sold? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, if if you if if you have to sell it at a certain price in order for your audience to want to buy it, then like it, I feel like that should kind of be this the case for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't go to a marketplace and like 
like usually they don't allow discriminatory pricing like that except that like apparently country to country that's an okay thing to do i mean so like even even like locally targets can sell goods at different prices even in the same state Mm, yeah that's true you know depending on where the store is located i mean Mm -hmm. it's it there's probably some limitations on how much the difference can be but there are certainly are cases where it can happen right it's what they're they want their margins to be maybe or right and you know if if it's a you know rural area they can charge less or more for whatever it is right or you want to put a sale in one store but not in another right so does (laughs) for for physical goods would you consider like the just the natural effect of i can't get to the store where this thing is being sold is that a form of trm okay no because it's not digital yeah (laughs) well it's not even rights management at that point it's it's that's just business yeah something or another yeah yeah. but i think like geography should play a role in some of that Mm -hmm. but in the digital world geography plays a much smaller role yeah yeah so i i agree and this is one of those things that kind of gets into my weird worldview that like i i i believe that there's a like a lot of things that are currently like the laws are differ from from country to country that i i think that we really need to like unify globally because Mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense anymore for right content to be governed in different ways in different regions when we have these distribution networks that are worldwide Mm -hmm. you know and and like small creators like ourselves can't afford to keep track of like okay this type of content is like legal in certain places and illegal in others and etc etc yep so yeah one world government that's my that's my pitch for it (laughs) sure we'll see see how that goes (laughs) yeah right and then the other the other reason that drm is commonly used is to protect corporate documents from unauthorized access how does that work out well you tell me i've never really been in a situation where i have like protected pdfs being sent to me that so is I... this more just an encrypted file that yeah needs literally. A, like a password open yep that kind of thing yep so that's that's not so much i mean i guess it's technically drm mm-hmm. but it's not in the same way as media that we commonly because it's not to the end consume. consumer yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a single password, not necessarily like a username password, like a front. You know, it's it's so directly it, on the file rather than through a system to allow it. So or, I think it depends. So Adobe has some sophisticated uh, document tracking tools mm. and uh, encryption. You know, you have to have a certain email address on a certain network and, you know, the, you know, sign right. in, use, use your authenticated password, use their service, blah, blah, blah. So, for example, that service, that, that software does not work on Linux at all. <laughs> yeah. And so... There's not only uh, the DRM from the perspective of using a document, but can you even use the software that it is because your system isn't supported at all by it? Mm-hmm. Because there aren't hooks that it can use to guarantee that it's not being tampered with. So Windows, for example, facilitates DRM yeah. because they want to be able to support that. Mm-hmm. But Linux does not want to facilitate necessarily DRM, and so they don't have those hooks that can guarantee that it's not being tampered with. Right. Cuz like Microsoft has business reasons to want to have those features in right. and the Linux community has philosophical reasons that they don't want it to be in there. Exactly. Yeah. And we'll get into a lot of that kind of stuff as well when we talk about some of the problems with DRM. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, we're going to talk about some specific types of DRM to kind of give people an idea of how to recognize when DRM is is a factor right right? and you've probably run into this already oh for sure yeah you just might not have known Mm -hmm. one note i would like to make right now is uh we're going to talk about encryption a a fair amount in this episode and if you want to know more about what the heck encryption is and how it works and why it matters we do have an episode of the extra dimension about that so go and find the link to that in the show notes of this episode All right, so we're gonna we're gonna break this down kind of by di- category of types of media, and we're gonna give you examples of types of uh, DRM that are commonly used there. So, games and software typically use product keys have been have been in mm-hmm. use for a very very long time. I mean, just look at Windows. I mean, right. You need a product key to get into the installer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of times, like, if you're buying a physical copy of this software, which is not very common anymore, no. you know, you'd have the product key that comes in the box with the disk, and and then I, I assume that, like, the installer has an internal algorithm that, like, compares that to... 
Something like that. I'm sure it was just reading a special section. Right. Yeah. Well, now a lot of software, too, is, is cryptographically signed. So mm. you need a central authority to be online and ready for you to even open the software. So, like, Apple needs to be online. Their certificates need to be up to date. Mm -hmm. Same with, I'm, just, I'm assuming, many things on Windows. Mm -hmm. So... You know what works now if you're off if your computer is offline for ten years and you try to open on these apps they might just fail because their certificates have expired and you're not online to get new ones you haven't updated things right speaking of disks a lot of times specifically in games less often in like productivity software but a lot of times they would require you to have the disk inserted in the computer when you are running it. Mm -hmm. On consoles, this was kind of a reasonable thing because they were literally running the game off of the disc, right? It wasn't like installed on the on the hard drive. Yep. But on on PC, there's like no technical reason that that should be the case, right? There yeah. there were historical reasons. They were the same for a long time, but not anymore, and not yeah. not for the last fifteen years, probably. Right. Yeah. Uh, so ancient history. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes that can be skirted around by just imaging the contents of the disk to a, a disk image on your computer <laughs> and mounting that right yeah with a virtual you just uh, have to cd drive have the contents of a disk on a computer all the time which takes up space right mm -hmm. and yeah so that like the reason that that was more common with games than with like productivity software is with productivity software you usually wanted to have multiple different programs running at once mm -hmm. you know so you want to have word and you want to have you know something else running that you're like copying stuff to and from and it would not do to have to have like multiple disks in your computer at the same time. Two disk drives. But with games, you're only running one game at a time, I hope. What are you doing otherwise? Goodness gracious. <laughs> Tying games to online accounts is very, very common. And also mention activation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the modern approach to, to games. So anything you buy through Steam or Origin, you know, you have to be online. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the provider has to also be online for you to even launch the game. So I know Electronic Arts has had issues with this for games they've released in the past. As yeah. Their servers go down. You can't play the game. You play suffered from a DDoS attack kind of early in its existence. And so Ubisoft games were not really accessible during that time. Yeah. yeah. For some types of games, it makes a lot of sense you know so like if you're playing a game that is l like literally only has online components like maybe league of legends right it yeah. makes sense to require you to be logged in but for the vast majority of the games that i play which are just single player experiences you know like there's there's no reason for me to have to do that and a lot of them you know will support offline play as well but mm -hmm. you have to be online to download it and sign in the first time to kind of yeah. sign your installation Speaking of Uplay, Ubisoft, at least for a while, built a lot of their games to just download like the beginning of the game, and then as the player played through, it would continuously download later sections of the game as they went, which not only suffers if like their servers go offline, but also if I'm not aware of that and I just like take my laptop up to the cabin with me and I'm trying to play through like Assassin's Creed and then suddenly like I can't I can't continue. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's no good for the consumer. Yeah, and and some some of those things aren't necessarily uh, you know tied to, D, to DRM. It's I feel like it's maybe less intentional and more of a premature optimization. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And making yeah. assumptions that you're playing on a desktop on Ethernet with a fast that you'll and you'll never bandwidth. Network. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have infinite storage. Yeah, clearly. Now, this last one is kind of, I like this example a little bit because it's kind of like a snarky thing to do, is uh, introducing like errors or insurmountable challenges in, within the game that activate if a copy detects that it's illegitimate, right? Oh, yeah. So like having, I think in, in um, Serious Sam 3, there was like some unbeatable like creature that would that would spawn and chase you if, if it you know if the game thought that it was being pirated and you know would kill you pretty quickly yeah so. i've heard of a couple of games doing this and that's a, a clever way of kind of getting back at the people who have pirated the, the software yeah and especially it's especially funny to me because you might not realize that you've been caught you know it like for most of these DRM schemes, if you're trying to pirate a game and it doesn't, and, and you can't like play the game, then you know that you've done something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, you're like playing the game, and then you're just having a really hard time playing the game, right? And so you might think that you're you just suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ebooks are a really interesting category because almost all of them 
deal with like encrypting the file itself and then like allowing the user to decrypt it using some sort of username and password right mm -hmm. whether it's a username and password that's the same as like the amazon account that you bought it from or a lot of distributors will use like adobe's drm scheme where you log into an adobe account and then adobe will download like the content for you the you know the real content or something like that i have had to in order to like unify my ebook library i have had to like strip drm off of a lot of my files in order to upload them all to google books so that i can just have one app that i go to mm -hmm. in order to to open them but um but yeah you know you, if you sign into your account in one of these apps you maybe aren't able to export the book to open elsewhere so they just kind of lock you into their system mm -hmm. you know? I don't and, a, and a lot of these uh, systems use proprietary file formats anyway. Yeah. So even if they were DRM free, they might not be commonly transportable. Right, because Google Books can't take Mobis. Right. They can only take EPUBs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Video. Oof, boy. The video. Don't get me started on the video, the, the movie industry. I don't think that they're transitioning to digital in a very well, graceful the manner. The movies everywhere seems like a good push that's a combination of everyone. It does, it does, yes, but I still can't just download them onto my hard drive, you know? Yeah, not you. Video, yeah, is always DRM pretty much. Yeah. So from the get-go, DVDs, which was like the first digital form of, of movies that we had. The first um, digital video disc. Yes, there you go. Those had encryption on them from the beginning. But of course, the technology for that was developed in 1996 and has been cracked for a very, very long time. So it's pretty easy to rip DVDs onto your hard drive these days. Yep. Blu-rays were more difficult because they were developed later, had stronger encryption. But Brian, I believe you, you told me that that encryption has also been broken for yeah, a few years. Yeah, there are ways to rip Blu-rays. I've, I've never done it personally, but I know it's it's possible. Right. And the other thing probably holding people back is the fact that like DVDs max out at 8 gigabytes, you know, whereas Blu-rays max out at like 50 gigabytes. They're and a so, little bit bigger. Yeah, who wants to or take up all their hard drive space? Or they're 28 or, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. they're, they're huge. Watermarks. This is the first time we've seen this DRM scheme. So watermarks are a type of thing that don't prevent you from opening the file itself and playing the content, but it makes the content itself less desirable, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime that you see like the logo of whatever TV station is your local TV station, right? On top of like, you know, down there in the corner, that's a watermark. Sometimes they get way more aggressive and have like a watermark that kind of spans the entire width of the screen and stuff you know and so those are usually put on like preview versions of videos kind of thing that aren't intended for like final the final consumer yeah. so that people can actually like watch a little preview of it before they actually buy like the full content yeah so i know there's there have been a couple of movies and tv shows that have leaked over the years and they're usually like dvd screeners and they're black and white and they have some watermark across the whole screen. Mm -hmm. So that just, you know, people will could still find it and watch it to get the content, but it's not it's not a, a full release. Right. And it and it makes it very very obvious to anybody watching that like this is this is not legal content, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then the the final thing for video is uh like streaming, like not actually selling you a copy but mm -hmm. selling you access to a whole library of videos right this is becoming more and more common in many forms of media you know we've got subscription services for movies and for music and you know it's kind of the, and... the prime time of drm at this point so you don't even get a whole file anymore right you get chunks of a file over time and they're buffered in such a way that you only have a few at any given time mm -hmm. and it's cheap enough and easy enough to consume it without really needing to transform it in a different way. Right. Prime time. Yeah. And and fun fact, this is actually like one of the few usage cases where I'm totally okay with a company enforcing DRM on me is like when I haven't actually bought a copy of it, right? And I'm 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 very aware of the fact that I am am just like accessing content that they are allowing me to access right yeah it's it's the way of delivering content when you do a subscription so mm -hmm. amazon prime netflix apple music spotify it, it's they all kind of fall under that you know you you're paying for access to media you're not paying to own and have yep in some cases well usually those are all offline some some way now but and the reason that many many of these streaming services 
will allow you to like download stuff offline on mobile but not on like desktop is they have much more control over what those files do on your mobile device right yeah. they can kind of lock it down so that only their app can access that content and like you know spotify does does have that available on desktop but like you know they they still encrypt it and everything and you know even though you could probably figure out what folders it's being stored in on your on your home computer and you know try and move it around but they They're probably still won't. encrypted files and you can't open them in any standard player yep yep and i'm i'm very interested in kind of this shift from like an ownership paradigm to an access paradigm mm -hmm. right and so i've been doing a lot of research on that with not just digital goods but also like physical goods and so keep an eye out for an episode about that mm -hmm. in the future here on the extra dimension music has had kind of a similar history as videos, but I think that they've transitioned into the digital world a lot more gracefully than video. CDs can very easily be ripped, and part of that is because like DRM is actually not allowed in like the CD standard, but a lot of music companies did start selling CD-ROMs that had DRM on them. Um, so important distinction there is that CD-ROMs are not technically compliant with the CD standard. And yeah, so those were a little bit like kind of common for a little while, but the industry has definitely moved away from them. Digital stores for music like iTunes and, you know, it was pretty funny reading the Wikipedia article for this because they were talking about like Napster and Livewire as though they were current events, you know? <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. They were current when it was written. Exactly. Um, but yeah, like a lot of these, a lot of these digital stores would sell DRM protected copies of music because that was what the publishers like mm -hmm. demanded of them, right? Yeah. So if you ever actually were uh, daring enough to actually see what those files actually look like inside... You know, everybody has this kind of free time. So you you, you, you download one of the DRM iTunes songs, mm -hmm. and then you look in the file, and it actually has, in plain text at the top in the header, your email address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the only signature. Really? Yep. Huh. Is that, that's all Fair Play, that, that's what Fair Play 2 is? That's, that's all it was at the time. And Fair this was, one, you know, maybe. you know, back in 2007, but that's all it was. That's super weird. And th those had the extension M4P for yes. protected. A ah, CD. instead of M4A. Right. Yep. So right. it was a very slim header, and of course, the proprietary format is what got everybody. Mm -hmm. But then Apple introduced iTunes Plus, which was DRM free songs that were of higher quality. And, and they, they cost a little bit more. Yeah, they were $1.29 of 99 cents. And then there was a time where you could spend 39 cents or 30 cents, 29 cents to upgrade an iTunes song to an oh, iTunes Plus song. Okay. I remember doing that a bit. This is They made the switch to everything being iTunes Plus and DRM free. I think it was April of 2009, because I remember paying yeah. to upgrade a lot of my library. Yep, yep. That sounds um, right. And now, you know, I, modern iTunes and Amazon MP3, they're, they're all DRM free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever, because I didn't start buying music for myself until, like, I went to college. And by that time, of course, it was industry standard to just, like, give people MP3 files yeah. that, you know, you can move around and, and access anywhere, which was very, very good for me, because, like... I had a SanDisk uh, MP3 player and like there's no way that anybody was partnering with SanDisk to like make their little DRM scheme available on, so on that I, device. So I still wonder, so when you buy something from iTunes now, DRM free, I wonder if it still stamps the file with who bought it. There is metadata of the owner of the purchaser. Okay. Yep. I haven't looked at the spec, but there mm -hmm. are, in the, if you look at the, the metadata about the file in iTunes, it'll say the purchaser and the purchase date. Okay. Mm. I think that's I think that's still okay as long as the file isn't proprietary and you could still do something with it if you wanted to. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean like if if you you can still get caught Yeah, but it's pretty easy to change that metadata. I ju I'm just saying you can still get <laughs> caught, you just have to not get caught. Right. And then of course, having subscription services instead of ownership is a very very big thing in the in the music world right now. Mm -hmm. And actually even like even if you're not paying for a subscription a lot of times these streaming services will have like a free tier where you can listen with advertisements and like you have a lot less control over what particular songs you're listening to kind of thing right and so in those cases they like there's no way that they're going to give you just like the file to mm -hmm. keep because that that would be absurd photos 
I actually don't have a whole lot of information about photos because I've never come across a widely used like image format that has DRM that's really viable. Yeah, I don't I don't know what that would mean. So from what I've seen, stock image sites are a classic example of they they have, you know, free, smaller or lower resolution with watermark mm -hmm. that are out there. You know, right. Your classic stock image. Um, XF data can contain copyright information. Yep. You can I think you can put anything in XF or it is kind of a structured defined format, but I think there is a field for DRM in photos. You can at least claim copyright on it and you can mm -hmm. open the photo unless yep. someone stripped it out. But that's kind of like any metadata of any file. Yeah. MP3. So it's much more of like the soft DRM mm -hmm. than the like actually we're encrypting this file. And I think part of that is probably because like images were a part of like the web standard from the very beginning. Right. And so we had to have these like very standard, easily openable by any device, you know, formats. And so like... It like the I don't think the web could have existed the way that it does if images had been like DRMable from the beginning. You pay for access to get photos. You don't pay for the photos themselves so much. I mean, you do, but it's yeah, it's not in the photos. It's around the photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, but most of the DRM on photos that I've ever seen is like yeah, not giving access to the full version, the mm -hmm. full resolution, or like the unwatermarked photo until somebody actually pays you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then finally, we have in the hardware department, uh, there's a few weird examples of, um, I mean, it's not actually digital rights management, but like, you know, rights as it, as it applies to consumers. Um, we've got like proprietary designs for physical goods that kind of lock out competitors. So like Keurig has tried to make their little coffee making machines that will only mm -hmm. accept the, the cups straight from Keurig and, and you can't like buy third party ones. I don't know how you would build a coffee machine that can't take other cups that are like the same shape. Like well, what the, do you do? Uh, clearly they failed. So yeah, right. Are we lucky. Mm -hmm. No more DRM there, but Philips at one point was trying to make like a, a, a bridge device that would only accept other Philips hue first party light bulbs. Lightning chargers is one thing that I thought of, you know, that iOS devices will often, in, if you if you try to plug in like a third party cord that isn't, you know, like Apple signed, Apple approved kind of thing, the device itself will tell you like, this isn't a supported charger, like you shouldn't be using this. And I don't, do they refuse to charge off of those cables or are they? I don't know the details so much. I think part of that is licensing the made for iPhone spec. Right. So Apple's enforcing a layer of quality as well. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. And then here's a very interesting example that kind of combines software and hardware is like John Deere got a lot of flack, but also like general car manufacturers have done the same thing where they obviously cars and tractors use a lot of software in order to run themselves. Right. And so they would argue that owners of vehicles can't like copy or modify the code that runs those cars even for the purposes of like repairing them mm -hmm. right so they would have to get those repairs from like a, a an approved technician or whatever yep. and so like do-it-yourself repair people are just kind of like their hands are tied right so it's a it's an interesting case in that one so when you need to fix a john deere tractor you can and it's a physical problem, like some kind of axle is broken. Mm -hmm. You can just go to the John Deere outlet by your farm and buy one. Yeah. It's no big deal. But when there's a software issue, when there's a bug, you have to rely on them to fix it because you can't, you don't have the source code and they won't allow you to change the, even the assembled version mm -hmm. of the code that's running on the machine. So. It, it, you're really just being held hostage there. And especially, I think, even if it's just a hardware issue that's wrong, a lot of times, like, the diagnostic mm -hmm. software that will tell you what's wrong is, like, you know, it'll only interface with somebody with, like, an approved, right. you know. Yep. So it's the, the concept of you might own the hardware, but you don't own the software running on the hardware. Yes. So well, and that's how they, that's how they get the legal shoe in there, right? Yeah. They 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 say that like, oh, this software is protected by the DMCA, right. etc. You are licensed to use it, but not to manipulate it. Mhm. Mm right. And I uh, and we're we're going to transition right over here into laws Heck conveniently. Yeah. 
So tell us about the DMCA. Yes, yeah, so this is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, for the United States. And it was passed in, like, what, 1996 or something, something like, like that? that. Some Sometime back then. And for our purposes, it covers a lot of different stuff, right? Including copyright. By the way, if you want to learn more about copyright law, we have an Extra Dimension episode about that um, that Brian and I were on back in, you know, like April of this year or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Check it out. Link in the show notes. But it also, the DMCA uh, has a lot of stuff about DRM. So, for example, it does outlaw the use or dissemination of technology for circumventing DRM. However, reverse engineering DRM systems is permitted. So this would be the type of circumvention that is necessary to make, you know, a piece of software or, you know, a piece of media interoperable with other software, right? So, so what that tells me is that, like, if I have a book that I've bought from Amazon, but I want to read it on my Nook, right? I am within my rights to try and figure out how to rejigger this thing so that it will actually be readable on my on my other, you know, ebook reader. Right. But then you just can't share it. Right. Yes. They also have exceptions that are allowed for research, but the wording in that section is like very, very vague. And so it's not very reassuring to researchers. And there have been several high profile cases of like researchers who have declined to publish their findings out of like fear of being prosecuted under the dmca mm -hmm. so this has affected like the, the the cryptography world a lot because if you're trying to research that kind of thing this is you know you're going to have to try to break other people's systems in order to test them right mm -hmm. and the library of congress i think every three years will allow exceptions mm -hmm. um, so i know jay freeman of like the jailbreaking world would often get together with people to try to add exceptions for smartphones, tablets, watches, game consoles, and things to allow tampering, or not tampering, but modification mm -hmm. of the software without being able to be pursued legally. Right. In the European Union, they have a copyright directive because, of course, the EU is a collection of countries. So, like, even though they have this kind of top-down, like, this is what you should be putting into your laws, the implementation of it is going to be slightly different each time. So it, it is pretty similar to the DMCA, but it only applies to offenses that have commercial purposes, right? So that's I I I think that that's a pretty good approach there because that specifically protects mm -hmm. people who are just trying to make copies for their own personal use, right? To yep. avoid having to buy a copy of of a, of a work multiple times, and it also I think would cover like people who are just trying to like lend out a copy to a friend for a little while, you know. But you know, as then we start selling it. Yeah. Then, well, yeah. Then we get kind of get into a little bit of fuzzy because, like, maybe I consider everybody in the world to be my friend, and I just put a copy of this thing up on my server that anybody can access, and I'm not charging anybody for it, so it's not commercial, right? Right. Right. Yeah. They also the EU, not in I think a specific law, but like a, a very high court in the EU has ruled that the resale of copyrighted software is express, explicitly permitted. Right. So as if if I have like a product key for Microsoft Word or something like that or a game or whatever like and I'm done with that thing I can sell it then to Ryan for cheaper you know than he would be able to get it from you know I, and I'll totally buy it yeah totally no that kind of thing would definitely go the other way because you have all of the software and everything that I want <laughs> and then we've got like a few not laws but like kind of licensing things that specifically deal with DRM so in the GNU general public license, they have put in a provision that states that anyone can break DRM on software that's that's licensed under the GPL without breaking any law, mm -hmm. which I think is really, really funny. Like they are above the law. They, <laughs> they and, and they don't like they don't ban the people who are trying to use the GPL license from implementing DRM. They're just saying that anybody can try and break whatever you make. Right. Uh, which I think is great. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very nor uh, normal and reasonable licensing model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Creative Commons also prohibits the use of DRM in their like baseline rights section of the licenses that they use. So since this episode, this entire show is uh, licensed under Creative Commons attribution, you can bet that we don't have DRM. That we know of. That we Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> And given our personal feelings on uh, DRM, you can also bet that we're not using DRM. That we know of. <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> 
So, yeah, let's let's uh, dig into our personal feelings a little bit by talking about some of the problems with DRM. I love talking about DRM problems. And we've touched on a lot of these as we've been going through them so far. But now it all comes out. Oh, yes, yes. We pull out all the stops. So DRM can often stifle innovation and competition, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are actually a lot of, like, not industry groups, but, like, you know, I'm thinking of the Electronics Frontier Foundation, right? They consider the use of DRM to be an anti-competitive practice, mm -hmm. and I'm right there with them on that. Uh, anti-competitive, anti-consumer. Yeah, mm-hmm. Especially because, like, from my perspective, as somebody who's also trying to make content, it increases the barriers for people who are trying to make fair use works, right? So, for example, in an episode of Second Opinion that Brian and Brandon recorded about Westworld, right, they were talking about some of the songs in the soundtrack and how, like, that added to the, the, the show. And so I was like, well, I should, you know, go and get some like short clips from those songs short enough to still be within like fair use, you mm -hmm. know, but like, and, and I totally have access to play those songs because I have Google play music all access. Right. But I don't have like an MP3 version of it because right. Like I don't actually own it. So I did circumvent some DRM in order to get a copy of it that I could then stick into the episode, mm -hmm. which would fall under fair use because it's a you know, like a, it's a creative interpretation. Right. Yeah. So, but I mean like, yeah, my using clips from it in the work was fair use, but me circumventing DRM in the first place is not really covered. Right. right. I, I was technically yeah. breaking the law under DMCA there. Yep. Yeah. And, and so that's one of my problems with the whole DMCA law is that breaking it is too easy to do with zero ramifications. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've... you can break it by putting the most minuscule amount of effort into converting something with a tool that you didn't even use, even on your own computer. You would just upload a, a file to a server. Mm. It does who knows what. And you get a new one back. Right. And you've, break, you've broken the law. They've broken the law. But nothing matters about that. And especially if, like, people aren't educated on what is allowed under DMC and exactly. what isn't, you know? Like, I wasn't even fully clear on what exactly is allowed until I was doing the research for this episode, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, we talked about earlier that it artificially locks people into particular e ecosystems, which is definitely not a good thing. We want people to be able to, like, portable take their all of their media with them to whatever devices they want to use no matter who the manufacturer is and also as time goes on if you have a collection of things now that you've paid a lot of money for and you really enjoy watching mm -hmm. is it going to work in 50 years when you want to like nostalgia trip and watch it all again like right. there's there's no guarantee of that i would almost say the high chance that, that wouldn't work anymore and you'd have to rebuy it and hope that these companies have migration paths but then you they have won't. to stay on it <laughs> yeah like it might work for a little while, but you just have to keep, like, so it's... And in the past, like, it, do that. when when the copies that you were buying were physical, right, it totally made sense for, like, okay, I don't have a VCR anymore, I have a DVD player now, I have to rebuy all of right. my movies, right? Because most people, most consumers, don't have the hardware necessary mm -hmm. to take a VHS and then recorded onto a dvd right and it would also still be kind of expensive to like buy all of those discs and etc cetera, etc cetera, right but nowadays like it the hardware necessary for doing that kind of conversion from one format to another is the device that you are consuming it on in the first place right and so there there's there's no really technical reason that the mp3s that i have bought shouldn't be available for me to be able to listen to in the future because it is a standard format. I should be able to convert them into whatever is a standard format in the future as well, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, they might not be as like high quality as like the versions that are the companies are trying to get me to buy in the future. Which is another problem. But if I don't care about that kind of thing, if the quality still sounds fine to me, like I can just keep listening to my existing copies. Yeah. So that, that you, you brought up a great point. So Often what happens now is when movies are made, when videos are made, when music is made, they're downsampled significantly <laughs> for consumer distribution. Mm -hmm. And then those MP3s are just out and about. And then over time, they can release new 
copies that are slightly higher remastered quality, or just slightly higher quality versions and their master copy is the highest possible quality which they could release and sure maybe it is a gigabyte instead of you know three megabytes right but it has all the data you could ever want because that's all there is yeah but it's part of their marketing scheme and, and so drm helps them with that have you ever seen them actually marketing that though well that no and and they don't want to but that is very clearly part of the plan sure so that's even more so true with video i would think yep. because with streaming you know netflix i think caps out at five megabit per second for 1080 maybe mm -hmm. which is i mean it's watchable but it's you see artifacts all the time especially on you know dark images and things you can you can see that and it's just inherent for the amount of bandwidth they want to use on it and when you right. buy an offline ver a blu-ray you know a, a video from that netflix might be streaming to you might be I don't know, three gigabytes for a full movie. Whereas if you got the Blu-ray, it might be 30 gigabytes. Like yeah. there's a huge quality difference for that. You you know, you can retain over time if you, and like Ryan said, is the Blu-ray even the highest quality version that they have available at the studio? It Prob is not. Probably yeah, not. No, it's not. It uses MPEG transport stream format. You know, the, the original version of a, of a full length movie, especially in 4k is probably hundreds of gigabytes. Yeah. Cause in, you know, in a, in a movie theater, they, they ship hard drives that are, you know, a hundred, a hundred or two hundred gigabytes that have huh. the movie on there, and those hard drives are loaded into digital projectors. Dang! And you know that's that's the modern way to do it, but those hard drives are never released. It's a no, Blu-ray, which is, you know, maybe only a, maybe a quarter of the size, but still a lot better than streaming. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons that I'm very very happy with like Bandcamp as a platform as yeah. a store because when you buy something they give you both the mp3 but also they give you the flac versions mm -hmm. of them so it's that's like, wonderful yeah that's the highest quality that there is maybe yeah getting media directly from the creator the creator releases it without drm so mm -hmm. you know they might have all their stuff in itunes and spotify or apple music for streaming through mm -hmm. drm but they might yeah put it on Bandcamp as well or another a site that you know follow their page and you get the downloads and i just the other day downloaded a handful of songs from an uh, artist f legally through his website that downloaded you know 45 megabyte wave files for all of his songs that's there you great go. you know drm free high quality and that's that's gets at one thing that i think companies need to realize more is that like drm doesn't really prevent piracy right that's its main goal it's failing pretty hard piracy isn't hasn't gone away since all of these drm you know schemes are but with are all the streaming it's making it more convenient to not pirate exactly yeah mm -hmm. so that's that's what you should be aiming for when you build a platform when you're distributing media is making it making the experience better for the people who are getting it legally than for the people who are you know trying and going and finding it on you know some shady website or whatever and i agree with that view however Streaming is wonderful. However, I would also prefer them to, to offer streaming in addition to having the full, highest quality oh, yeah. available version for the actual price that it costs for whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So often when you have these DRM schemes as part of the as a part of the business plan, they will make it cheap to buy, but not tell you all of the restrictions up front, or maybe ever. And if sharing is built in to the product you're buying, maybe price it more. Whatever, I don't care. Just mm -hmm. let me have it. Yeah, for sure. Now with all these, you know, DRM on streaming things. So I, I pay for Apple Music, as I'm sure I've made aware. And I, I use that a lot of it because I have an existing iTunes library of, you know, before Apple Music, I had 12,000 songs or something in there. And I had a playlist and play counts and a lot of metadata and I've cleaned it up a lot. And so I wanted to just keep adding new media to my library. You know, I'm fine paying it, but... How long is that going to last? Is Apple Music going to be around till the end of my life? Like, will I always have this media? And the thought of that suddenly, you know, going away with no easy path is really scary to me mm -hmm. because I really care about my collection of music and I don't want to lose access to playing it. Right. And I'm I'm fully locked into Apple Music. Like, I would pay it for the rest of my life, you know, same amount. Because yeah, that's... I, it's so ingrained with what, how I consume media now. If I were to buy all these songs, it'd be hundreds or thousands of dollars to buy every song that I've right. added. That, that is one thing that I hadn't considered, actually, when like Google Music All Access became a thing. I when, it, when they announced it, I did the math in my head, and I'm like, yeah, I've been paying more than $8 a month for you know to buy all the music that I want to play, so I might as well just go and get that, that streaming 
you know, subscription offer, right? I did not think about like, well, what happens if they stop offering the subscription option? Then all of those hundreds of dollars, probably thousands of dollars, you know, down the road that I have spent on this platform, right, is no longer any good for anything. And if I wanted to, yeah, get access to all of that music, I would have to either find a different streaming service to start paying, or if none of them are available anymore, then I have to start actually buying all of the music that I've been listening to. And then I'm like and double, the, but double the thing dipping. Is, all those files are on your computer. They're right there with the full music in it. It just, you can't play them because they're locked oh. and encrypted. Yeah. In the Google, Google Music example, uh, I don't have any of the files on my computer because okay. I just stream them. Now, from my solution for that is to just don't care about music at all, don't care about any files at all. None of it matters. Well, congratulations, Ryan. Not all of us live that life. I've I've been enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that I am really worried about is losing culturally relevant works in the future, right? So DRM schemes are only really good as long as, well, a lot of them are only good as long as the companies that created them are still around, right? And so if you are running like a library or, you know, like some sort of museum, right, and you want to have older digitally produced works, if they were like if all of the copies that were available were DRM protected, it's going to be very, very difficult to get those running in mm -hmm. the future. Right. And so so we are putting ourselves at risk of really losing a lot of the culture that we're creating nowadays by allowing DRM to like be widely used. And like we were talking about when we reviewed iOS 11 on second opinion that you know there's they're no longer allowing 32-bit apps to run in iOS 11, right? And so 32-bit apps are being removed from the App Store, right? So that would be an example of like if those if the people who develop those apps don't still have like unsigned copies sitting around, right? Then there's really no way for us to get them anymore because the App Store on iOS is like the arbiter of like what is available and what's not. So pretty risky. I don't know if that's a DRM thing, but well. Uh, it's yeah it's more of an ecosystem thing but mm -hmm. you know since since all of those apps are signed by apple right but they're not being supported on the platform because they don't support 32-bit apps anymore right. not because of an arbitrary reason about drm yes but like th this is a thing that is built into our technological progress right is right. that like platforms are going to change standards are going to change and so if if so it's part of planned obsolescence yeah 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 that's so a couple of years ago, there was a bug with macOS where their certificate expired. And every app that you bought through the Mac App Store, you'd open it and say, a message would come up saying, this app can't be opened. And you'd hit OK, and it would quit. <laughs> and then they updated their certificate, and you had to sign into every app again. So oh boy. you'd open the app, and you'd have a dialog come up, and you'd type in your username and password for your Apple ID, and then it would open. But, you know, it's really just one little thing away that, mm -hmm. that would prevent you from using all the software that you've purchased or whatever media it is. I mentioned that pirates, you know, always find ways around DRM. We've been talking about a lot of like digital ways to break it, like, you know, finding ways that to break the encryption scheme that's used on DVDs, etc. But one thing that we didn't mention is that the, there's always the analog hole mm -hmm. at the very least, right? If if this media is something that like humans can experience, Fun fact, I'm pretty sure that all media is something that humans can experience. Otherwise, we, could, we wouldn't call it media. Then you can record it, even if it's not like the exact same digital content, right? Let's say a game is, has a bit of an exception because it's interactive. Ooh, that's true. Yes. Um, other than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, for for passive, passively experienced uh, media, yes, you can always you can always record it. And it's a, it, it's a little bit more challenging in some mediums than others. Like, you know, for, for sound, the signal always has to be converted into an analog signal in order to be played on speakers, right? Yeah. So it, you can just Aren't like... Aren't we lucky? Yeah. Um, <laughs> for, for video, it's a little bit different because they, you know, it, the video file is encoding where each of the different pixels, you know, what color they are. And so that that can be maintained as a digital signal all the way through until it gets to the panel, mm -hmm. right? But I could build something that presents itself as a panel and then like go, okay. Okay, take those things and just put it in a new file. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Or you point an analog reel-to-reel -reel camera at a HDTV and <laughs> yeah. record it. Yep, yep. yep. 
So I think that that also speaks to the fact that pretty much all of the data that we're all of the data that we're looking at, listening to, seeing, experiencing, it's all just ones and zeros at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. And really, there should be no ownership over ones and zeros. If an order matters, who cares? I don't know. I don't feel too strongly about giving ownerships to ones and zeros. I feel like you're abstracting it too much for me to be able to have an uh, opinion on it anymore. <laughs> Developers always abstracting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering that, you know, I'm thinking before our digital age, all artifacts that people left were, you know, you can you dig up in the ground at archaeological sites and things mm -hmm. and you find it. But now we're at this digital age, like is all this going to be lost? Will any future society ever be able to read any of the things that we do, especially if we encrypt it all? Like, even if we don't encrypt it, just raw things, will they know how to read it? No. Yeah. It's, when you, when you, like when you give a, lost. when you give the future human a, a flash drive with an MP3 on it, they're never going to figure it out. Right. One thing that the, the shift towards access instead of ownership brings with it is that, you know, like, almost all of those schemes involve using an online account, right? And for like privacy minded consumers, if they don't have a way to get this media, you know, it, like in a, in an anonymous way, right. And not have all of their, the data about like what they're watching, what they're listening to, you know, be collected by the corporations, then we might be like totally cutting out a portion of the population that. Well, I while I don't agree with you know that, like their their life choices like those are life choices that we definitely have to respect right because uh, you know that's it's a it's a legitimate concern yeah yeah and also going along with this this whole access thing libraries change a lot you know that that we have access to so like I've had things in my music library that like were available at one point and then, you know, licensing agreements between Google mm -hmm. and other, yeah. you know, like publishers change a little bit. And, you know, like sometimes it's just like, oh, the album art looks different now. That's goofy, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. there but there are other times where it's like, hang on, I got to a point in my playlist that I know there was something else here, but, not, you know, like and, and they don't notify me, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like that like that's definitely not good for the consumer. Yeah, I'll I'll have songs from Apple Music, and occasionally I'll see this item is no longer available. I'm like, mm -hmm. great, I can't even like preview the song to see what was that song. Do I care about it? Should I go find another <laughs> version of it? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it a single that is no longer available? Now it's in an album. Like, there's no yeah mm -hmm. update around. Please that. just like email me and tell me what the change log was. Right. Well, it's <laughs> just another way to avoid having to tell the consumers about the lack of value. The problems inherent in the system. Right. Yeah. And and also the lack of value that you are getting for paying maybe maybe to them a paltry sum that adds up, but to you maybe a significant sum. Mm hmm And then finally, when like a work is available cross platform, quite often, you know, DRM will require these like companies to have agreements with other companies in order to build the DRM into different systems, right? <laughs> Microsoft. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and like because of that, a lot of times open systems will be left out because there isn't like either there isn't a central organization that like maintains that or there's there's no hook in the system. Mm -hmm, yeah. Or like the community that's maintaining it has a philosophical disagreement with the existence of DRM. Right. Well, licenses don't agree. Or... Exactly. Yep. And so we've we've dealt with this in the case of like DVDs being played on Linux in the past. There Any, was uh, anything being played on Linux, <laughs> pretty much uh, drivers for Linux. Uh, well. So a lot of video codecs and things are have copyright on them, so you can't mm -hmm. you can't install it in the in a native Linux inst distribution because they're they're non free. You know they're not they're not GPL licensed or something. So right. you have to go out of your way to download the codecs to play the video and go out of your way to find libraries to decrypt. DVDs and you can do it and install it all together, but mm -hmm. it's it's a complicated system and that that makes it much harder on the user who just wants to watch a DVD on their computer. Yeah, for yeah. software that is not licensed with DRM. Yep, and then we then we get into like really crazy examples such as the encrypted media extensions being built into browsers, right? So like. This is a is a DRM scheme that has existed for quite a while, you know, and different browsers have implemented it uh, over the years. You know, Google in particular, it, like in order to maintain their market 
you know, leading market share in browsers definitely wanted to make sure that their users would be able to play like DRM protected video, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't want Netflix users to suddenly see a message like, okay, you're going to have to go and use Internet Explorer instead, nah. right? And, and like, the way that the market works, that would push people away from Chrome and towards Internet Explorer, right? And so... Actually, earlier this year, uh, in like September of 2017, I think, mm -hmm. uh, that a W3C relented. Yeah, like put this this as a standard into the what is it called? What is that? What is that? The spec. The spec of of W3C is that what we call um, it? It's HTML5. Okay, yeah, it's but, just yeah. another part of the spec. Yep. And so now, so yeah, like it's a built-in thing in the the programming language that is used to build all of the websites that we visit right? right and so so now in order to like so there are be pros able and cons view... of that so it's you know in the old days if you wanted to watch netflix in mm -hmm. a browser you'd have to download some kind of silverlight plugin right yes and, so, and of course silverlight was not available for linux so you couldn't do that at all there mm -hmm. but then on windows you'd have to download silverlight and i think on os 10 you'd have to download silverlight yep. And then it could play through that tool, and that tool had hooks into the system so that it could do all of its DRM decryption mm -hmm. stuff. It was great. Now, what's bad about that is it had to inject third-party code into the browser in order to get interoperability, yep. which is sort of nefarious and fishy. Now, the, the new W3 version doesn't have that direct injection. It just offers a first-party hook into it. So it's not like kind of backdooring the browser anymore it's going through the front door which is better mm -hmm. but still awful yeah so we don't have to deal with flash player or silverlight anymore but right. we have direct first party integration instead which makes it more efficient more streamlined but it makes it even more accessible for others to use yeah and the electronics frontier foundation did not take well to this at all and so they actually resigned from the w3c yeah, yeah and i think that's that's nearsighted on their part it's it's one of many battles in the future. So mm -hmm. the next big DRM scare, I think, will be in the future of WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is the idea of not just using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, th these very plain component building blocks of web mm -hmm. websites. Instead, WebAssembly is taking arbitrary source code and compiling it down to effectively assembly and then giving it to the browser and executing it. And it's so much further abstracted it's very close to the ones and zeros i was talking about earlier yeah. and 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 it's it's not something you can go back to like you can't take it and go back to the original source from anymore it's just this black box of hmm. who knows what and i and 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 so for example when we use adblock plus here on these computers or ublock or whatever and we change the look and feel of the website what if you can't do that anymore because you can't change mm. any of that assembly code because you don't know what it is? Right. So it's not necessarily a DRM-based problem, but it's a proprietary solution coming down, getting closer to you instead of being more interoperable. Right, right. Which is one of the reasons that I have loved the, the internet so far, the web, right. is that, you know, there's... It's all so open. There's sort of you can, well, yeah. Comes and goes. Yeah, exactly. Mostly just goes these days. Yeah, really. <laughs> and yeah, like like I said, I do believe that there are certain usage cases where like having DRM is uh, is legitimate like interest, right? Especially when you know it's it's like it's not the end user owning a particular thing, but as soon as as soon as the expectation on the consumer's part is that I own this a copy of this thing. You should absolutely not have DRM on it. Right. So that's that's my stance on it. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So if you have any thoughts or feelings on your stance about DRM, please contact us. We are the Nexus. You can find us on Twitter at the Nexus TV or send us an email at the Nexus TV at gmail.com. And also since this is the show where we tackle all kinds of different topics, if you have any suggestions for topics that we can do, go ahead and, uh, and message us as well. Brian and Ryan, where, Hi. Can, where can people find you guys on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter, Ryan Mar, and of course on my website, ryanrapperset.com. You can find me on Twitter at Brian M. Nope, that's my website. You can find me on my website at brianm.me or on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. Nice. And I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck or on my website at ianrbuck.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. 
Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.